This man was responsible for the death of up to a million people in Nazi-controlled Croatia. It was one of the worst atrocities of the ethnic cleansing in World War II. His name, Andrea Artukovic, Nazi Minister of the Interior in Croatia. He arrived in Ireland in July 1947. In July 1944, this man commanded an SS unit responsible for some of the bloodiest actions of the German occupation in France. His name, Celestan Lane, commander of the Breton SS militia. He arrived in Ireland in December 1947. This man murdered hundreds of Jews in wartime Poland, often burying his victims alive. Even today, no Jew lives in the villages he visited. His name, Peter Menton, SS Schaffuhrer. He arrived in Ireland in February 1963. In 1945, as a naive 16-year-old, I joined the Royal Air Force and was sent to Burma at the end of the war against the Japanese. On leave in Ireland, we couldn't wear our uniform because of our neutrality, something that irritates me still. When I returned home from the Royal Air Force in 1947, people who were part of the Nazi terror were being allowed into Ireland. Former collaborators and Nazis, some of whom were actually involved in the Holocaust, were seeking asylum in Ireland. And official Ireland seemed to give a greater welcome to Nazis and former collaborators than they did to returning war veterans. Come with me then on my travels as I try to find out who these Nazis were, where they came from and how they got into Ireland. Rathgar in Dublin is a strange place to begin my hunt for Nazis, but in 1947, this quiet leafy suburb became the hideaway of the man responsible for the death of up to a million people in wartime Croatia, Andrei Artukovic. In Los Angeles in 1985, Artukovic, now a frail old man, was extradited from the United States to Yugoslavia for war crimes. Over the course of his extradition, it was discovered that Ireland had provided him a safe haven as he fled from Allied justice. Artukovic was one of the architects of the Holocaust. He belonged to a Nazi regime which began the final solution in Croatia even before the Germans began the slaughter of Jews. It was to reach an apex of genocide in places like Auschwitz. come to Croatia to learn about his crimes. When the Germans overran Yugoslavia in 1941, they established a puppet state in Croatia for their pre-war allies, the Ustasha party. The Ustasha were a right-wing Catholic group which ruled the Nazi-backed independent state of Croatia between 1941 and 1945. The Ustasha movement was an extreme right-wing nationalist movement which emerged out of the University of Zagreb in the 1930s. And its basic ideology was that it believed in a greater Croatia which would be independent from Yugoslavia and would be cleansed of all racial minorities, um, Gypsies, Jews and especially Serbs. Artukovic was the Minister of the Interior and he was really in charge of all the internal affairs of the state. Um, he's very, very prominent, for example, in the instigation of the Holocaust in Croatia. In February 1942, um, when the Ustasha opened their parliament, he gave one of the maiden speeches. 
Brittany actually said that the Croatian regime was going to deal more ruthlessly with the Jews than the Germans had. He referred to the Jews as parasites who were living off the blood of the honest Croatian worker and the honest Croatian peasant. And this is really the signal that the Holocaust is going to start. We know Artukovic was a deeply religious man. While in Ireland, he attended mass daily at the church of the three patrons in Rathgar. For Artukovic and the Ustasha, their Catholicism was bound up in the fabric of their movement. Most of them were Catholics. Many of them had been to seminary schools as well. They really try to portray themselves as true Catholic sons. Um, for example, they make abortion punishable by death, both for the doctor and the woman seeking the abortion. Drunkenness is banned. Swearing is punishable by a fine or internment in a camp. And of course, the Catholic papers love this. They think this is brilliant. Even when the Ustasha movement decide that they want to convert Serbs to Catholicism, again, this is something which the Catholic Church is very sympathetic to. It suddenly feels true Catholic values are coming back to Croatia and everything's going to be so much better. The Ustasha set about creating their racially pure Catholic state. To do this, they looked for the support of the Catholic Church. One of the most infamous clerical supporters of the Ustashas was the Archbishop of Sarajevo, Ivan Sharic. Um, he really kind of endorses the Holocaust. He says, you know, sometimes you have to use tough measures against people and there are limits to God's love, which is really saying, actually, it, it will be OK to kill all the Jews. It won't matter. This support from the Catholic Church would later help Artukovic get into Ireland as he escaped justice for his crimes. In 1942, such thoughts were far from Artukovic's mind as he set about cleansing the Croatian state. In Zagreb, I meet historian Ivo Goldstein, an expert on the Holocaust in Croatia. So, Ivo, what would Artukovic's role have been in the terror? Well, he was one of the promoters of the system of terror. He, as Minister of the Interior, he signed the racial laws. He was in the organization of the concentration camps. The system was uh, orientated versus the Serbs, the Jews, the Roma population, and all those Croats who were regarded as a real or possible threat to the regime. The main concentration camp in Croatia was called the Yasanovac concentration camp. Now, this wasn't one camp, this is a complex of many different camps. It wasn't just Serbs in these camps, also Jews, gypsies, communists, and anyone who really opposed the Ustasha regime. The prisoners were taken out to work, did really work that would kill them. Hard labor really wouldn't qualify what it was. They lived on starvation rations. Many of the prisoners just collapsed and died. And the Ustashas also tried to poison a large number of prisoners. And, you know, it was a daily occurrence that prisoners would be made to line up and they would be taken out and some would be selected and they would just be shot on the spot. One of the unique and horrible things that Ustasha movement does is it actually establishes concentration camps specifically for children, and it tries to poison the children in these camps, and that's one of their main methods of actually killing people, is just starving and poisoning them to death. I think it's really important to understand that Ustasha method of slaughter in Yasanovats uh, was not methodical, um, it was not very efficient, and there's a really strong element of sadism and torture to it. It wasn't just actually killing someone, it, it was about posing for photographs, uh, torturing them, uh, psychological damage. And there's so many infamous stories. I mean, there's one story um, where a father was made to actually um, kill his own son and then bury him before he too was executed. And these stories are very common. The horrific crimes of the Ustasha turned the Croatian people against the regime. Many joined Marshal Tito's communist partisan army. Slavko Goldstein fought with the resistance. He witnessed the brutality of the Ustasha at first hand. There was a Orthodox church near the area where my unit operated. And in this church, they burned about, some say, 80, between 80 and 150 people. Burned alive. 
and within there and we found some traces, such things, keys and so, from the people. So we knew what happened, of course. Ertukovic was responsible. He was one of the people who organized the basis for all the killing. Directly, he was not in charge of the concentration camp, but of the collecting the people for the concentration camp. He signed some orders. Uh, in principle, you have to send such and such groups of people to Yasenovac. Yasenovac was a dead camp. Between 80,000 and 90,000 have been killed there. Enough about him. In May 1945, communist partisans overthrew the Ustasha regime and the leaders fled Croatia. Artukovic fled to Salzburg in Austria, where he was captured by the British. Immediately, Tito's communist government requested his extradition for war crimes. In spite of the evidence of his crimes, Artukovic was released from military custody in 1946. Someone, we don't know who, was looking out for his interests. He fled from Austria and went to Switzerland, where he stayed for a brief time before the Swiss recognized him and ordered him out. He then made contact with his wartime Catholic connections who came to his rescue. To get into Ireland, Artukovic made contact with a Croatian Franciscan, Monsignor Kronislav Dragonovic, a man who helped many Nazis flee the continent. Dragonovic supplied him with false papers and put him in touch with the Franciscan church at Freiburg in Switzerland, who recommended Artukovic to the Irish consulate in Bern. Having secured Irish papers, Artukovic and his family arrived in Ireland in July 1947. Obviously, from his point of view, it's a Catholic country, so there's a connection there. Um, I also think Ireland had a reputation, if not for being sympathetic to Nazis, and then for being very unsympathetic to communism. And so he thought he might find a receptive climate. And I guess at that time, Ireland must have seemed like quite a quiet place, somewhere where you could just hide yourself for a few years, lie low, until you decided what you were going to be able to do. Little is known about Artukovic's time in Ireland. He kept a low profile and didn't draw attention to himself. Here in the quiet Dublin suburb of Rathgar, Artukovic and his family lived. He under the assumed name of Alois Anik. Safe, he felt, from Allied vengeance and prosecution. And I, I think it's strange that a man responsible for maybe a million deaths could live quietly here, nobody asking who he was or how we got here. I have discovered there is a file on this man in the Department of Foreign Affairs, but the Irish government have refused my request to release it. On the 15th of July, 1948, after he'd secured an Irish identity card, Artukovic immediately left for the United States. He settled in California, where he worked as a bookkeeper, still living under the assumed name of Alois Anich. In the 1950s, he was exposed as a war criminal, and the Yugoslav authorities demanded his extradition from America. It would take nearly 30 years of legal wrangling before he was finally extradited back to Yugoslavia, where he was sentenced to death for his crimes. Artukovic would never face the executioner, he died in prison in 1988. To understand how Ireland could harbour a monster like Artukovic, I need to go back to wartime Ireland and the country's relationship with the Allies. Just 20 years after the War of Independence, many in Ireland found it difficult to lend their support to the British, even though they were fighting a totalitarian regime like the Nazis. While many Irishmen and women like me went to fight with the Allies, the Irish government kept the country out of the war. Ireland declared neutrality in September 1939. De Valera had well in advance of this indicated that neutrality was the only option for an independent Irish state if Britain went to war against Germany again. 
it's a classic expression of absolute sovereignty by an independent state, that what goes on elsewhere is not really of concern to this state unless it affects this state. If it doesn't, then it's of no consequence. Irish neutrality was certainly pro-allied. Uh, de Valera himself described it as a friendly neutrality, and Ireland's position in the war has been described as unneutral neutral Ireland. Neutral Ireland's relationship with the United States was not terribly good. The uh, US representative in Ireland, David Gray, did not get along with de Valera at all. And David Gray was very determined to have the Irish hand over Irish ports for the use of Allied navies, and uh, also was uh, determined to have the Irish come into the war on the Allied side. And he very much believed that the Irish position was jeopardising the uh, Allied war effort. By the end of the war, relations between the Americans and the Irish had deteriorated rapidly and it was purely a formal set of relations and indeed it, it might be said that the Irish government was prepared to obstruct any suggestion coming from the American government in particular. In spite of Ireland's pro-Allied stance, the Americans were afraid that Ireland would become a refuge or a haven for Nazi war criminals. And here in the Irish National Archives, I've found a note written in 1944 by the US Ambassador David Gray to Eamon de Valera. And in it, Gray is demanding that Ireland refuse entry to any Nazi war criminals who sought refuge in Ireland. To Eamon de Valera, this was Americans tampering with Irish sovereignty. De Valera, because he'd been challenged on that very issue of asylum, would obviously then ensure that post-war asylum policy would be firmly in the hands of the Irish government and would not be dictated to by other powers. The Irish government was never prepared to give an unqualified position to the Allies saying we will not allow former German military personnel or others into Ireland. De Valera and a significant body of opinion in Ireland, particularly nationalist opinion, believed that Nuremberg was illegitimate and they believed it was a victor's peace and a victor's trial and they effectively believed that those who were executed were murdered in the same way as Irish nationalists had been judicially executed in the 19th century and they're quite explicit about that. De Valera was not prepared to entertain, as far as I can see, the extraordinary nature of the Nazi regime. He saw the Nazi regime as a regime like any other as a nationalist regime representing uh, the German people to, to a large extent. He was well aware of the extermination of the Jews. He was well aware of the behaviour of the Nazis in the course of the Second World War. And he was aware of this well before the end of the war. It doesn't make him pro-Nazi, but what it does make de Valera, I think, is rather narrow in his focus. What I think you do have in Ireland, at the very least, is a scepticism about the right of the Allies to accuse anybody of being a war criminal. So that, that at least opens the possibility and the prospect, if somebody actually did arrive in Ireland, that the Irish government would certainly not arrest them and, and expel them from the country. The Irish response baffled the Allies. And I quote from the file, ERA would deny admission to all aliens whose presence would be detrimental to the interests of the Irish people. In other words, the Irish government was nicely fudging the issue. And the word was out that in Ireland you had the chance to escape Allied justice. Sixty years on, it seems inconceivable that Ireland could become a haven for war criminals, but that's exactly what happened. But it would not be Germans who took advantage of this, but an SS militia inspired by the IRA. Brittany has always been a place that saw itself as different from the rest of France. The province was split between those who were pro-French and Breton nationalist. When Germany overran France in 1940, they found that some Breton nationalists were willing to collaborate. In 1943, opposition to the Nazis was growing in Brittany. The Germans needed local help to defeat the resistance. 
They found it in a local right-wing militia called the Beson Perot, founded by an extreme Breton nationalist called Celestin Lane. Celestin Lane was born in 1908 in Nantes, in Brittany. From an early age, he identified very strongly as a Breton and not as a Frenchman. Uh, so he became involved in Breton nationalist politics and very much uh, was influenced by the Irish model of the IRA, of physical force nationalism, that is adopting um, an uncompromising, violent opposition to French rule in Brittany. Many Breton nationalists, in varying degrees, had advocated some sort of collaboration with the Germans in order to secure Breton independence. So Bezin Perot was the extreme militant wing of that tendency. A fighting force that was purely Breton in action against France. And because it undertook that role, it ended up essentially being used as an auxiliary force by the Germans to root out resistance fighters. Célestin Lenné était le chef euh, euh, incontesté de la Maison de C'est lui qui négocie avec les Allemands. C'est à la demande de Célestin Lenné que les membres de la formation Perrot ont touché un uniforme Waffen SS. C'est une unité de la euh, SD. SD, c'est le Sicherheitsdienst. En fait, c'est la police SS. Bonjour, madame. C'est même la seule unité militaire allemande composée exclusivement de Français à s'être battue contre d'autres Français sur le sol de France. Euh, leur mission, c'est la, la, la recherche de, des résistants et infiltrer les maquis, infiltrer les réseaux de renseignement. Il y a des dossiers que j'ai retrouvés aux archives. Il y a eu des enquêtes après-guerre où, effectivement, plusieurs témoins font état de membres de la formation Perrot en train de torturer les, les résistants. Nous sommes ici devant l'école publique d'Uzel. Pendant le mois de juillet 1944, Uzel est occupé par un détachement de la Wehrmacht. Il y a également des fêtes de gendarmes, trois officiers de la Gestapo et une dizaine de membres de la formation Perrot. Évidemment, on ne peut pas les reconnaître, ils sont en uniforme allemand. Et ils participent ici, dans cette école, aux tortures des résistants qui sont arrêtés dans les villages autour du Zell. Le soir ou dans la nuit, les résistants sont emmenés dans la forêt de l'Orge où, effectivement, ils vont être fusillés ou pendus. Here in these woods, outside the village of Ussel, is the Field of Martyrs. In it, the mass graves of 34 men and women, tortured and executed on the instructions of the Nazis by the Besson Perot under the leadership of Celestin Lanny. Among those buried here is Marie Chrysostom, aged 20 years. She was executed on the 14th of July, 1944, Bastille Day. This was no isolated incident. There are mass graves like this all over Brittany. I went to meet Desiree Camus, a resistance leader. His unit fought against the Besson Perrot in Brittany and suffered heavily at their hands. The uh, militia of the formation Perrot, the Besson Perrot, commanded by Celestin Lenné, are arrived in this sector and 
on demandait où était la ferme, où était le maquis, en parlant en breton et habillé en civil. Les gens leur ont indiqué où était cette ferme et sont rentrés dans la ferme en disant « Nous sommes en panne avec notre voiture, est-ce que quelqu'un peut venir avec nous ?» Et c'est là donc que le moine Yves et Henri Robert et Henri Yves sont venus avec eux jusqu'à la voiture. Et là, ils les ont amenés jusqu'ici et ici, ils les ont tués. Massacrés. Voilà l'histoire. As the head of the Besson Perrot, Celestin Lanet may not have pulled the trigger. He may not have tortured anyone, but he was the mastermind behind their actions. In 1944, as the Allies liberated Brittany, many Breton collaborators implicated in the crimes of the Nazis fled France. Among them was Celestin Lanet and the most loyal followers from his SS militia, the Besson Perrot. It was a journey that would take them all the way to Ireland. Les plus, les plus compromis, ceux qui savent que de toute façon, euh, s'ils reviennent en France, c'est la peine de mort. Hein, des gens comme l'aîné, comme euh, plein d'autres. Hein, euh, euh, pour eux, pas question de revenir en France. Donc le, là, c'est la fuite à l'étranger par les réseaux, bah, les mêmes réseaux que les réseaux nazis. Hein. Ceux qui sont revenus en France, qui se sont fait euh, arrêter par la, par la police, euh, certains d'entre eux avaient sur eux des documents, euh, des lettres, des lettres écrites, euh, décrites en anglais, euh, de recommandations auprès du consul euh, d'Irlande à Paris pour leur trouver une filière pour aller en Irlande. En 1947, il a que escape to Ireland. The first Breton nationalists who had arrived in Ireland after the liberation of France reported that the Irish government was prepared to grant them asylum. The former head of the Breton Nationalist Party, Raymond Delaporte, reportedly had an interview with de Valera, in which de Valera advised him to continue using the alias with which he'd entered Ireland, so that then, if the French asked de Valera, is this man in the country, de Valera could truthfully answer no. Celestin Lenné, by that time known as Neven Hinoff, and an associate came from Germany, crossed into France and were at Paris, where they then obtained uh, false ID cards that enabled them to travel to Britain and eventually to Wales. Neven Hinoff and other members of the Bezin Perot who came via this route entered Ireland that way. Lanet kept a low profile in Ireland, but he did associate with other Bretons. Jean-Pierre Lamatte, a Breton anarchist who lived in Ireland in the 1970s, is one of the few people who got close to him. What I know is that they were welcomed, but they were not helped. When I met him, uh, he was living very poorly, uh, first in uh, Coolock, near Dublin, and after that I met him in Oranmore, near Galway. He was so knowledgeable, he could have been my master. And he was so opposite in the idea. He was a friend of the Nazi, he was an anarchist, so we can have been enemies. I believe that we were between the two. He was, for me, uh, not a master, not an enemy, but uh, something between the two. Lane's time in Ireland went largely unnoticed. Few people got to know him. He died in Dublin in 1983. Neven Enaf created the Besant Perot uh, when uh, everybody was sure that the German will not win. And he wanted to leave uh, something uh, unforgettable for the Bretons and for the French. And the best way to leave something unforgettable is to leave something unforgivable for the French. And that's why he created the Besant Perot. <laughs> 
As the Allies pushed through the Nazi territories, they stumbled across one of the most shocking examples of man's inhumanity to man. The Allied soldiers who liberated the concentration camps were always appalled by what they saw. Some of them indeed were traumatized for months, some for years afterwards. And I have to say that going through these camps today, one is still filled with that awful sense of foreboding. Across Europe, the Red Cross struggled to find temporary homes for the many victims of the concentration camps. Ireland was asked to help. This request exposed a latent anti-Semitism within Irish society. Ireland discriminated against Jews before, during and after the Holocaust. During the 1930s, Jews were discriminated against in how they made applications for refugee status. During the war, prevalent anti-Semitism in Irish society made it difficult for the government, that is de Valera, to move forward with plans to help Jewish children from Vichy, France. After the war, anti-Semitism remained official in the sense that it was laid out in government memos. By the end of the war, uh, what we can see is that there was a reasonably widespread view in government uh, that a liberal policy towards Jews would not be taken. Immigration was opposed in particular by the Department of Justice and by the Department of Industry and Commerce. It was believed that Ireland was a Catholic country which had strong antipathy to Jews, but there was also a very strong view held quite widely that Jews didn't fit in, that they were different, that they were exploitative, that they would actually not become Irish, that they would not become part of the society. Uh, and when you actually look at the figures, there's very, very few Jews actually allowed in at any stage uh, after 1945. It is unfortunately the case that two civil servants with pivotal roles in dealing with Jews were in fact anti-Semites. One was Charles Bewley, who was an official in the Irish legation in Berlin. He had become fairly enamoured with the Nazi project and indeed was quite enthusiastic about Nazi discrimination against Jews. He remained in post right through the 1930s. Another civil servant, Peter Burry, an official in the Department of Justice, who was regarded as a friend by a number of people in Dublin's Jewish community, used his position as a civil servant to advocate discrimination against Jewish refugees. My father, Robert Briscoe, was one of the founder members of the Fianna Fáil party. A lot of people don't realise that an Irish Jew was one of the founders. That mightn't go down well with some people, but nevertheless, that's what he was. And then he was elected to the uh, Dáil in 1928, and he stayed in the Dáil without a break through successive elections until he retired in 1965. So my father, after the war, was trying to get a few, just a few, Jewish refugees into Ireland. Palestine was closed, nobody wanted them, but this country did not allow them in. And the unfortunate thing was that my father at that time was very friendly with the secretary of the Department of Justice who had total control over who got visas and who didn't. And his name was Peter Berry. And my father uh, and Peter Berry were on first name terms. It was Peter this and Bob that. And uh, Peter Berry used to come to our house. My father used to go to Peter Berry's apartment. I think it was in Clyde Road. But I used to drive my father because my father didn't like driving. So I was actually party to this meetings where Peter Berry would say to my father, I'm doing the best I can. And uh, it's very, very difficult and making all sorts of excuses. My father really thought that Peter Berry was doing his best. And because of the Freedom of Information Act, when the memos that Peter Berry had been writing to other departments got out, uh, saying that under no circumstances are we to take these people in, they don't assimilate, they etc., etc. I was so shocked 
when I saw this, because I had met this man, I had heard this man, I had watched this man's lips, that for the first time I was glad that my father was dead, that my father was not alive to witness the way he had been uh, abused by Barry's lies. The most profound images were those of the child survivors. What to do with these pitiful orphans of the death camps? In April 1943, de Valera agreed in principle to accept 500 Jewish children from Vichy, France. The Irish Red Cross contacted officials and asked them that when discussing the project in public, in effect, that no reference would be made to the fact that these children were Jewish, so that when the project was publicised, it would be publicised as a project for refugee children, not for Jewish children. In 1944, Oliver J. Flanagan challenged de Valera in the Dáil and asked him about Jewish children. De Valera replied that he knew of no such children, that he had no details of, in effect, of Jewish children. I think it says something about Irish society at that time, that Irish leaders seemed to be afraid to admit that they were helping Jewish children flee the Holocaust. I think it says something about the level of anti-Semitism at that time, that Jewish children could only be helped by the Irish government by stealth. By 1944, it was too late for the 500 children. It would be the end of the war before any Jewish refugees were in a position to come to Ireland. Finally, in 1947, a hundred Jewish children were given a temporary home in Ireland. It is important that the Irish uh, were prepared to acknowledge responsibilities in respect of the children, but it was in a very severely constrained context. They were not going to become citizens of Ireland. They were not going to become permanent residents. I think the more general point is that despite uh, the victory for a more liberal position in, in respect of the, uh, the children, uh, overall, very few Jews actually arrived in Ireland. By the 1970s, Ireland had put its past as a haven for Nazis behind it. However, one case would reignite the debate once again. In 1976, the small rural community of Mahon Bridge in County Waterford became the centre of a media circus. Dutch millionaire Peter Menton, who divided his time between Waterford and Holland, had just been exposed as a war criminal. You've collected over the years. Yeah, I collected newspaper, uh, newspaper yeah. cuttings. Yeah. Yeah. Local historian Sean Murphy has followed the Menton case since the story first broke. You had seen them and you knew them. Oh, yeah, we knew them. Everybody knew that they were there. Peter Menton was li living in Cumber House. His wife, Meter, was living there. Uh, everybody knew that he was a Dutch businessman. When Menton would come, it was a very important occasion. Like, everybody would know that he had come because the local driver would have been sent to collect him from the airport and bring him down. There'd be a bit more excitement around the place that he was around, you know. I think he was known as a, a retired millionaire art collector, and he kept very much to himself. I think even the locals up there, apart from the people who worked in the house and around the place, I think the very few people saw little of him. Well, he did invite in people, like, like Wasif and Sheila invited in for tea, and people would be invited in now and again. He spoke to us about his house in Bellericum, which he said was the largest thatched house in Holland. And he also said that he had an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We found this a little bit disturbing. Well, not disturbing, but, you know, unsettling in that. Why would a very wealthy man be, be boasting to myself and Sheila, who had no interest in the largest this or the largest swimming pool? Uh, like, it's like kind of a, a very wealthy person boasting to the local yokels what he had in Holland or what he had on the moon when they didn't even know where Holland was. Like. Manton was in the lumber business, so he came to Poland very often and then decided uh, to stay. And already before the war, he became a multi-millionaire. 
Menten uh, got acquainted with uh, Isaac Pistiner, who was a business partner. He did a lot of business with him. And he got very uh, friendly with the entire uh, Pistiner family, also with the nephew of Isaac Pistiner, a guy called Khabib Kanan. That young boy adored Peter Menten. And he uh, very often talked with his so-called uncle, Peter Menton, about his plans to move to Palestine. And Menton even encouraged him to do so. And when he finally decided to, uh, to move to go to Palestine, it was Menton who went with him to the station, to the railway station in Lvov, to say goodbye to him. Canaan joined the British army during the Second World War in Palestine. And in, I think, 42, he met in Tel Aviv uh, a guy from Poland. He knew his family, and he also knew about Menten. So Kanan then inquired and asked the guy, how is my family and how is Uncle Peter? And then the guy answered, oh, my God, you don't know the story. He said, no, what happened? He said, well, your so-called Uncle Peter has killed your entire family. Canaan dedicated his life to capturing Menton with little success until Hans Noop discovered his story. I was an editor of a news magazine in Holland and got a phone call from uh, an old lady who I knew very well. She started to talk to me about a, a newspaper interview which appeared in the Saturday issue of The Telegraph. It was an interview with a guy called Menten, a multimillionaire, one of the biggest art collectioners in the Netherlands. She said, I am the correspondent in the Netherlands of the most prestigious and authoritative uh, newspaper in Israel called Haaretz. And there is a guy working there called Khabib Kanan. And Menten has killed uh, part of his family. Hans contacted Canaan, who told him the terrible details of Menton's crime. Menton lost his money in the war. The places where he owned a property, real estate, was in the eastern part of Poland. So when the Soviets invaded Poland, he was expropriated and lost everything, so he was bankrupted. So he moved to Krakow. He offered his good services to the staff of the German SS General Schengart. Both shared their love for art, and both of them went out to loot art from Polish nobility and uh, wealthy Jews. For his own protection, Menten was allowed to wear the uniform of an SS Scharfuhrer, which is uh, first lieutenant. It's not a very high rank. But of course he was able to give orders, orders to, to SS men who accompanied him uh, when he went back to those villages which he has left a couple of years before, including Potorotze where the Pistina family lived. He was seeking revenge on the Pistina family because he got involved before the war in, uh, in a lawsuit with Isaac Pistina after a, a business deal which failed. They were suing each other and Menton lost and had to pay a considerable amount of money to the Pistina family and he was seeking revenge. In Potorotze, he killed all the members of the Pistina family who were around and also killed hundreds of non-Jewish uh, people there, peasants, who were, uh, let's say, working on the land which he used to own before the war, before he got expropriated. And he was able to do that because he was wearing a German uniform. Hans's research forced the authorities to investigate Menton's crimes. In 1976, the Soviet police agreed to open a mass grave that contained the bodies of Menton's victims. Thirty years later, what are your feelings, Hans, when you see this place? Well, 30 years ago, it was fall, October 76. It was very, very bad weather. And there were probably about 100 Soviet soldiers here on this side, at that time it was still the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. doctors, uh, pathologists were putting all the bones which were digged up here on huge tables and 
putting them together. Those Russian soldiers were doing their work. They had uh, water, they were cleaning the bones. The pathologists were putting every bone next to the other so that, let's say, a pattern of a dead body uh, became visible. Yeah. It was a horrible sight if you looked into the ground here because the bodies were still laying there. Some of them were still in good shape. Not all of them uh, were just bones. And when they decked up the bodies, you saw, for example, David Stott's shoes of little children, probably uh, seven, eight years old, uh, all kinds of, of items. It was a horrible thing to see. It was one of the most depressing days in my life. He came here with two SS men, with machine guns, uh, uniformed men as well. He was very calm, very relaxed. He was sitting on a chair, armchair, drinking brandy, uh, smoking a huge cigar. And you have to imagine that the entire village was forced to witness the execution. Even small children were forced to climb trees because they were too small to watch. They needed to climb trees to see the execution of the relatives. The grave was closed, not by the SS, but by the relatives of the people. And many of them were still alive. Many of them were, not all had died, but the grave needed to be closed immediately because they wanted to leave. Hans returned with all the evidence he needed. But before the authorities could press charges, Menton, who was in Holland at the time, went on the run. Then I decided that I need to track him down. So after about, I think, 10 days, I finally uh, managed to find his hiding place. He was hiding in Switzerland. So I went there with the Dutch police and uh, together with the Swiss police, uh, he was arrested in his hiding place. Did it come as a surprise to you then to learn that he was a war criminal or that the Dutch were going to try him as a war criminal? Oh, I did, of course, yeah. I mean, you mean like you, you, you know the area here. It's a nice, quiet, rural area. If three dogs started fighting in the street in Manhattan Bridge, like, it would be a major news incident in the locality, like, you know. So it was a major surprise to the people that he was a, a, a war criminal. When the allegations became known and extra allegations about the deaths and what he was supposedly involved in and how he behaved during uh, the massacre of Polish Jews, well, it was, uh, was mind-boggling, really. World War II had come to sleepy uh, rural Waterford. Menton was sentenced to 10 years for war crimes by a Dutch court. When he was released from prison in 1985, he announced that he intended to live out the rest of his life in Ireland. Well, opinion was divided on, on that at the time because people who didn't live in the area, people like kind of outside the area, small, were very vociferous that he shouldn't come back. The attitude local people had was he didn't interfere, interfere us when he was when he was living here. Like you know, he gave a bit of employment and there was work for people and there was a bit of money around. And sure, he's an old man now. What was he? Eighty-five or eighty-eight years of age. So what harm could he do? You know. The first thing I knew about it was I was spokesman for the. A Jewish Representative Council of Ireland at the time. And I got a phone call from ITV. And they said that they'd like to interview me about Peter Menton. And I said, who's Peter Menton? So basically, that's how it started. That weekend, I was fortunate in that I met Garrett Fitzgerald, who was the Taoiseach at the time. And I mentioned to him what was happening with Peter Menton. I don't think he even heard of him. And I said, it's going to get a terrible name for Ireland if this man is allowed in. He said, well, let me think about it. Two days later, he phoned me up and he said, 
he's been barred or banned from entry into Ireland. Manton died in 1988. He never showed the slightest remorse for his crimes. Clearly, Manton had believed that Ireland would welcome him, and Ireland's past as a haven for war criminals probably encouraged him in that belief. However, Ireland in the 1980s had come a long way from the country that embraced war criminals with open arms. Ireland's post-war record of apparently refusing to allow Jews into the country while giving asylum to committed Nazis is something of a stain on our history. And even now, 60 years later, we must surely ask ourselves why the survivors of the Holocaust were kept out while the people who caused it, the Nazis, were not just allowed in, but were able to prosper in my country. In the next programme, I will investigate former Nazis who came into Ireland after the war and how they became an essential part of Irish society, playing a major role in the business and political life of this country. Including Otto Scorzani, the SS commando leader who was dubbed the most dangerous man in Europe. The Belgian collaborator Albert Likes, who got caught up in the biggest political scandal in the history of the Irish state. Flemish nationalist Albert Folans, who would become Ireland's leading educational publisher. <laughs>